Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Food Industry Development webinar series. My name is Kira McDonough, and I am Head of Food Industry Development in Chagask. This webinar series is delivered fortnightly on Tuesday mornings at 9.30 a.m. And over the coming months, we will be bringing you a range of topics of general interest to the food sector, highlighting our expertise and services that we can offer to Irish food companies. Today's webinar will provide an overview of sensory science and how food companies can apply this within their businesses and benefit from its application. Our speaker today is Carol Griffin, who I'll ask to join us now. Carol works in food industry development with large and small food businesses, servicing their needs in terms of new food product development, sensory and consumer needs. This webinar will involve a half hour presentation, followed by a short question and answer session. Joining Carol is our colleague, Christina Otinishtin. Christina, if you can join us now, thank you. Christina is currently working as a food technologist at Chagask. She is a PhD in food engineering with over 10 years experience in food research, having worked in the meat sector prior to that. At the bottom of your screen, you will find a Q&A box. And there you can ask, answer, ask those questions that arise as you listen to the presentation. Um, we will then pose them to Carol and Christine at the end in the Q&A session. If for any reason you experience technical difficulties or you lose contact during this session, please don't worry as this session will be recorded and it will be available on the Chagas YouTube channel following on from today. I'd like to thank you now for your participation and for joining us this morning before handing you on to Carol to start. Thanks, Kira. Um, so in our food research centre in Ashtown in Dublin, our prepared consumer food centre has a wide range of facilities and equipment. So if we want to move on to the second slide there, Kira, that'd be great. So these facilities are uh, for use by the food industry. There's also a packaging suite and sensory facilities. So the sensory suite has about eight, has 18 tasting booths and two food preparation kitchens with sensory software, adjustable lighting and temperature control ventilation. We can assess a wide range of foodstuffs. We can prepare them for our consumer panels. Um, so we recruit those to assess products for our clients. We also have trained descriptive sensory panels uh, in place in Chagas, so they can profile a diverse range of food and beverages. We carry out in-company and public training as well on a range of sensory topics, so that might be of use to, to people in industry. And training of in-company sensory panels works really well as the group are trained together on their own range of food products. So what is sensory science? So it's used to evoke, measure, analyze, and interpret responses to products as they're perceived through the five senses. So your senses of sight, smell, touch, taste, and hearing. So that's either by consumers or by trained panelists. So if you look at the drinks bottles on the top right, the flavors are further en enhanced by the visual cues that the colors give you. So the lemon and lime is yellow orange uh, for the passion fruit and orange and then the the darker pink for the raspberry and pomegranate so you might sometimes get frustrated in your job but spare a thought for those poor people there who are sniffing armpits and um, if you make a claim for something like a deodorant last 24 hours this is where sensory science also comes in so you need to be able to back that up so those people would be trained sensory analysts uh, so they can detect odors at different levels. And the same would apply to fabric softeners. So if you look at the cute little child there, um, trained panels are used to assess uh, softness, that kind of thing. Sensory science can also be used to determine the best colors or shapes. Um, so we just, just go back one second on um, Things like medicines. So white tablets automatically make you feel calm. Um, red tablets give you a little bit of a, a I suppose an edge, a, bud, uh, a buzz. So straight away, you're starting to feel a little calmer even before you take your medicine. 
But the packaging also can influence our expectations. So uh, a few years ago, Coca-Cola Life was launched and it's a lower calorie version made from stevia and sugar as sweeteners. So it was purposely colored green to suggest that the product contained more natural ingredients. But in 2017, they announced that the sales had decreased and with increasing sales in Coke Zero, um, the life was, was discontinued. So we're not sure, was it the color of the can? Did it not sit with consumers? Or was it that Coca-Cola Zero was introduced? But it was, it was most likely a combination of both of those. If you look at the Walker's crisps, normally most other varieties of um, salt and vinegar crisps are packed into blue packaging. But interestingly, Walker's have stuck with their green one, which they said they're not going to change uh, because they feel their customers are familiar with the product. Um, Tropicana, another example on the packaging side. So they changed their packaging from that nice one on the left with the um, fruit, with the uh, packaging, uh, fruit on the packaging. It suggested that people assess product as being far more higher in nutritional attributes if they can see the fruit on the pack. So the customer f consumer feedback indicated that the packaging on the right that they introduced didn't have the quality look that they associated with Tropicana, and it's a premium product. So the company reverted back. Um, question there, had they carried out sufficient consumer research into that? So making some changes. Um, so when launched, the Crystal Pepsi was a clear cola, but this didn't fit with consumers' expectations of what cola should look like, so it's usually on the brown side. And it was fairly quickly taken off the market. And also, Coca-Cola in the 80s reformulated their iconic product. Um, sensory testing had been carried out, and it was deemed acceptable. But when they launched, their loyal customers didn't like the fact that the original recipe had been interfered with. So this just illustrates that taste is, is one part of the equation. There are other things to be considered. Um, also, studies have found that when people were blind tasting beers, consumers rated supermarket uh, beers higher for liking. But then when the brand information was put back in, a different outcome was found and the branded product scored higher. So this proves again that sensory is just one part of a bigger picture. Other changes that were made were, you might have recalled Cadbury's making a decision to, to thin down the chocolate layer of their cream egg, uh, cream egg product, so to reduce the amount of chocolate used. But loyal customers didn't like this, so their eating experience was very, very different now that the chocolate was thinner. Um, there was a campaign, how do you eat your uh, Cadbury's cream egg? So if it's a very thin or a much thinner um, coating, your experience is going to be different than what it would have been before. So again, consumer testing was it carried out, was enough of it done. With the bar of chocolate, so as, as we chew our food, the texture changes, release flavors at different times. So when Cadbury's changed the shape of the chocolate bars a few years ago, from the regular squared off edges to the more rounded edges, Consumers actually thought that the recipe had been changed, but it hadn't. It was the melting um, of the chocolate was slightly different with the new rounded edged bars. So the bigger picture, as I mentioned, sensory is one part. Um, it's one part of the techniques that should be employed. So consumer and research, uh, or consumer research and marketing analysis are also essential, especially at the beginning so we need to ascertain who who wants who would want to buy this product. So identify your target consumers, and also where your product sits within a category. So sensory and consumer trials should be employed to determine that the product will meet these perceived needs of your target consumers. Moving on to our senses. When we talk about sensory evaluation, people generally understand the role that taste and flavor play, but the other senses are also employed. So how a product looks is very important to consumers. Visual cues, 
such as lemon in lemon or yellow color of lemon ice cream. They inform the consumer the taste experience that's awaiting for them. Sounds like the fizz when you open a fizzy drink or the snap of a biscuit or chocolate bar. They also inform the consumer of what they can expect from the product long before they even put it in their mouth. Stale crisps will sound different to the ear from fresh ones. And how easily the knife cuts through your steak will give you information about its tenderness long before you ever put it into your mouth. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase, we eat with our eyes. Looking at this mayonnaise, I'd expect it to be smooth and creamy and the apples to be crisp and slightly sour, just from how they look there in the picture. Even experts have preconceived perceptions and expectations. In a test a few years ago, a group um, of experts profiled red and white wines. They assigned different sets of attributes to the two wines. What they didn't know was that they were actually given the same wine on both occasions, but the red wine was colored, um, was a colored white wine. So even perceptions from an expert's point of view, they have their own expectations as well. Looking at taste. So we perceive the five basic tastes via our taste receptors that are on our tongue. So things like sweets like sugar, salt as in table salt, sourness, so like lemon, vinegar, citric acid, or bitter compounds, so bitter like caffeine, your tonic water, and umami, that, that savory, moorish type of uh, taste. So we all have different densities of the different taste receptors. Super tasters can detect even small concentrations. For example, some people are very sensitive to the taste of the quinine, your tonic in your gin and tonic, while others are almost blind to it. And a geisha is when you aren't able to detect some or all of the basic tastes. Moving on to smell, so olfaction. So our nose is really good at detecting thousands of different odors. We perceive smell either through our nose from the outside environment, so that's orthonasally. Also, when we chew our food, it gets warmed up. The volatiles are, are uh, released and they're detected in the nasal cavity. So this is retronasal olfaction and it's how we perceive aroma. So just after the um, presentation, if you want to illustrate that to yourself or if you have children in your house, if you hold your nose, and pop a mental sweet into your mouth while you're holding your nose. Think about what you perceive. So you'll just be perceiving sweetness because they're the receptors on your tongue. And then if you let your nose go, the mint flavor will flood your senses. So that's the aroma. So that's a nice one. And then if we look on to um, recognizing odors. So the sense of smell is really important to our enjoyment of the eating experience. And anosmia is when we, we lack that ability to smell. This can be temporary, so when we have a cold or a flu and we don't really taste our food as well as we normally would. It can also be long term, so in the case of a brain injury. But also, the reduction in the taste and smell has been linked to COVID-19 symptoms. So our colleague um, Emily Crofton is part of a team of EU-wide researchers who are studying this phenomena at the moment. So they're looking for people who have experienced a loss of taste or smell following contracting COVID. Um, so they just want them to complete a short questionnaire. And if you or anyone you know has um, these symptoms, it'd be great if you could contact us um, or visit the JAGAS website. It's about our senses working together. So in reality, all of our senses work together. So we take cheese, for example, and we look at it. We have an expectation of what it's going to taste like. Yellow cheese, so light colored versus darker, we're going to assume a, a, a different tastes there. We might cut the slice and then we begin to make assumptions about the texture. So is it crumbly? Is it rubbery? So this is before we ever put it in our mouth. Once we do, and we start chewing, we're gonna start detecting salt levels on our tongue. 
as it heats up, the volatiles are, re are released. Then we perceive the various flavor compounds that are particular to that cheese. These are released over the time as we uh, chew and swallow the product. And the level of fat will give us a certain mouthfeel as we chew and after we swallow as well. Then if a company wants to re-engineer the product, so you might want to reduce the salt or the fat levels, this will have an impact on the structure, which will have an impact on the texture, the flavor release, and the mouthfeel. So all of those senses working together have to be taken into consideration. So what are the applications for sensory science in the food industry? At various steps in the process, we use different sensory analysis techniques. It can be used as part of your product development process to maintain quality assurance or to establish, establish shelf life of some products. So for a lot of products, it's not always the micro changes that end the shelf life. It can be their sensory quality start to diminish and they aren't the product that you want your consumers to continue tasting. So that ends the shelf life. Another application is benchmarking or comparing your product versus competing products. And sensory science can be used for problem solving as well. So for detecting taints that might occur in your product. So some beers have taints that regularly occur in their product. So when we're going to look at our uh, sensory analysis and NPD, so using sensory techniques will really give you a lot more information um, that you can elicit from your products about your customer preferences. The sensory techniques can be employed right throughout the product development process. So from idea generation through to product launch, but also after to track the quality of your product and the customer appeal of your product. So you can put that together then with your sales information. So at the beginning, um, you, Sensory can help you define the attributes. So you can either use internal or external panelists. And in Chagas, we've got um, a few different uh, sensory descriptive panels. But staff can be screened as well to sense, um, to identify different um, attributes in your product. So you have to check their sensory acuity and work with them on that. Then you really need to define your sensory attributes at your kitchen scale stage, your product development early stages, and also as the product moves through the product lifestyle, right up to production. And as we said, the end of shelf life for some products is a sensory one rather than a microbiological one. The idea is that we arrive at sensory specifications. So we develop them, which will define your targets and ranges of what's acceptable to you. And ideally, consumer trials should be carried out uh, just before you launch new products. So um, for a, a non-biased view of your products. And then these sensory specifications that you use, they'll become part of your quality assurance system. And then next, looking at the sensory evaluation and quality assurance. So once the sensory specs are developed, this should be used to ensure that your ingredients that are supplied over time or from new suppliers are consistent. Final product should be compared to the agreed specs, either between batches, over time, over the shelf life of the product, or if you change suppliers or you make any changes in your processes. Or indeed, if you, ch if you move your process, there could be changes there that you need to uh, keep on top of. Now, I'd like to give you an overview of the general sensory methods. So there's two broad categories. So we've got analytical, which is objective measurements, or hedonic and liking, which are more subjective measurements. So they're the yellow ones. So for hedonic measurements, we use consumers so they give their responses to the perceived quality of the foods being tested. Preference and acceptability tests are the common techniques used. So how acceptable is the product to the consumer and which do they prefer? So they're the questions you'll be hoping to answer there. 
And looking at the red side, the analytical methods are more objective. So discrimination tests. So they're designed to objectively measure perceived differences in a product. And we use trained panelists then when we carry out descriptive tests. So they would measure and analyze the products. And they act more like calibrated instruments. And they don't use hedonic or liking terms, such as I like the product. Concentrate now on the consumer tests. So when we're testing with consumers, there's a few things that we need to consider. So for example, how many people should I use in the test? Ideally larger numbers when you're about to launch a product. You can uh, work with smaller numbers during the product development process, but you might need to carry out several consumer studies during your product development process, depending on how well it's going. But make sure you choose the right consumers. So they should be habitual users of the product. Otherwise, you're going to get very, very different answers than you really should get. Different, there are different types of consumer tests. Um, so you're measuring the consumer's opinion of the product. Either do they prefer it, so which pro or which product do they find the most acceptable, or a combination of both. So hedonic and liking scales are used here. So we've just got two examples there. We've got a nine-point um, hedonic scale. So it would score one for dislike extremely on the left, and it would score nine for like extremely. There's one, uh, the just about right scale, so the JAR. So you can give, you can get more information about what consumers think about different attributes when you ask those questions. So such as the sweetness, is it sweet enough or is it too sweet? And you can also interchange those with pictures for scales for children to make it easier for them. Moving on now to discrimination tests. So the question we ask here is, what's the nature of the difference between the samples of the products? And you can use consumers here, <coughs> excuse me, or trained panelists. So you might have heard of a triangle test before. It, it, it's one that uh, some people would have heard of. So this is a discrimination test, but there's many, many others that you could use. And it depends, so the type of test you'd use would depend on the resources that you have. So if you have a lot of money to spend, so the size and nature of the difference in the product. So if there's a very big difference, you shouldn't even be using a discrimination test. And also, whether you want your consumers to detect a difference or not. So you might want to change something and not have them detect a difference. And then the nature of your product will dictate what discrimination test you can use, because it might have a very spicy or highly tasted flavor to it. And also, how many panelists do you have access to? So if we move on then to descriptive analysis. So Descriptive sensory techniques can help companies to design and formulate food products. So it helps them by understanding how the ingredients and processing impact on the sensory profiles of foods. So you see in the picture on the left, that would be uh, one of our internal panels there in Chagas. And we've screened um, and trained a number of these panels. So they characterize and unravel complex flavors and texture profiles of foodstuff, so a, a wide range of foodstuffs. So these expert panels, they can be used in a range of applications. So at the product development stage, quality control throughout, um, the sh uh, and throughout the shelf life. You can also use them to define how your marketing um, campaign can go, to, to, to find the words that will best describe and capture um, an interest in your product from consumers. So we want to ask the question, do we need to use trained external panels or can we use our own people? And employees can be trained to act as in-company panels, but they should be screened for the basic tastes. And then there's a combination of other tests that you would use to determine their taste thresholds and also their descriptive ability. And I've worked with quite a few businesses where I trained the groups of employees in how to detect and describe the key sensory attributes of their products. So they're the experts in their products. 
And then we'd move on to familiarize them with how to quantify and score the attributes they're perceiving. So the aim is to get that panel working together as a group so that they objectively measure the product's attributes and then assess them. And these assessments are rep reproducible over time. And they can be also, as I said before, uh, taught to recognize any off flavors or taints that can be common in their own product. How the steps that we would be involved in training a panel. So you might start with 30 or 50 potential panelists. So let's assume you're a big company. Um, they should be willing. So they should have an interest in food in general and not be averse to the products. And then you'd also ask about, um, have we got any intolerances, um, that kind of thing. So following the screening and the testing, you might end up with about eight to 15, it's probably a bit um, over um, estimate there. Maybe you might have 10 at max. Obviously that depends on the size of the pool of staff you have. So this panel then should be brought through the training and the products. Um, that the company are involved in. But then the, they need to be monitored over time. So you need to monitor the performance to see that they're acting like what I would call a, a, a trained panel working really well together. We've got some case studies for you. So uh, the first one, uh, the client wanted to convince a retailer to list their free from confectionery product. So rather than the competitor's product, which was on the shelves at that time. So the, there were a few issues we had to work through. We needed to make sure that um, the consumers were recruited. So the, the right consumers were recruited. So it would be those who would be used to eating the free from, uh, free from products. Because if you were more used to eating non-free from products, you'd be likely then to score the products more poorly. So the panel we produced or we uh, recruited were vegetarian, mainly vegetarian or vegan consumers. Also, the retailer deadlines were really short, so we had to recruit the specialist panel quickly and carry out the testing at a short timeline and also follow up quickly with a really clear and precise report. So we decided on consumer preference and acceptability tests. So we thought they were going to be the right tools. And thankfully, so the next slide will give you just one of the results. Uh, there, were, there were a lot more. Thankfully, the graph shows you that the consumer's product on the right in orange was much preferred to the client's um, current, so, sorry, the, to the retailer's current product. And also, further tests showed us that the texture, mouthfeel, and sweetness levels were much more preferred in the clients than in the retailer's current product. So this is what the company needed then to be very, very clear in um, presenting that to the retailer to help them um, show the, the vast difference between the two products. Another case study we have um, to look at is cooked meat. So in this instance, the manufacturer of cooked meat products felt they needed to reformulate their current product. So they wanted to make it more appealing to a wider range of consumers. It was a, an established product and they wanted objective ed evidence rather than just from the technical team's uh, point of view. So what we did was the original product contained, so the, on the next slide you'll see um, what we did. So the original product contained a lot of additives and the company wanted a cleaner label. And the new processing methods since the original product was developed meant that less additives could now be used and it still retained its nice properties. So looking at what we did, um, we carried out consumer preference studies and we used it um, to test on a consumer pan panel of regular users of this type of product. So we want to look at the results um, on the next slide. We'll see that the new product was significantly preferred to the original product. And the flavor, texture, the succulence, and the eating quality were considered by the consumer panel to be far superior in the new product. So the technical team's assumptions were proved right. And it's always nice to be able to give uh, a client good news like that. So then they decided, yeah, they were going to run with the new recipe. 
So that gives them the objective evidence they needed. Looking to the future, um, innovations in sensory science include lots of devices and equipment. So they've been developed to try to capture consumers' automatic reactions to foodstuffs. So the aim is to obtain the objective answers as humans can, they can be really subjective if you ask them questions directly regarding their preferences. So if you see on the top, there's facial recognition software that can be used. And we carried out a, a small study at the end of last year to capture and interpret consumers' reaction to a range of plain yogurts, so with different acidity levels. So yogurts hadn't been used before. And we were able to link the reactions. So the reactions for surprise and disgust were linked with the more acidic and the artificially alkaline products that we produced. And then the reactions corresponding to happiness or liking were linked with more middle of the road acidity levels of yogurts. So the, the consumers we recruited had to be regular users of plain yogurts and eat plain yogurts on a regular basis. So that gives us some nice information there. Um, so there's going to be more and more work. That's going to, to feed into uh, client work um, over the coming few years. And the last one, just before we move on to Christina, is eye tracing glasses. So they can be used to determine what are the key drivers for a consumer choosing a product. So someone wearing these, um, these glasses, there's a record where on the shelf the consumer's attention is focused. And also it looks at where they're focusing their attention on the pack. So is it the nutritional information? Is it the price? Is it the front of pack information? So that all gives us um, a lot of information as to what helps uh, consumers choose what they're choosing. Because you might run a consumer panel and people say, oh, I love that product, but they mightn't actually go out to buy it or go buy it on a regular basis. So these, um, these newer methods help us with that side of things. So Christina is going to talk to you now. Um, she's experienced on the applications of virtual reality in sensory science. So she's going to explain now how our surroundings, um, the environments can influence our eating experience. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Carol, for the introduction. In the next minutes, I would like to highlight the potential benefit of virtual reality within the food industry and present the findings from one of our study, the impact of tasting beef steaks in a traditional sensory booth versus an immersive virtual reality restaurant. The aim of the study was to utilize um, immersive virtual reality techniques to investigate the influence of surrounding context on consumers' sensory perception of beef steaks. As you can see in the images, uh, two different experimental conditions were set up, a traditional sensory booth and an immersive virtual reality restaurant. If you would like to visualize the 360 video that was used for um, this study, you can scan the QR code um, that will be available on the presentation on Chaga's YouTube channel. Um, going further to the results, uh, the beef attributes were rated on the nine point scale where one um, was dislike extremely and nine like extremely. We found um, significant statistical differences for all the sensory beefsteak attributes when the results from the two different contexts were compared. A significant increase in perceived liking scores for the beefsteaks samples evaluated in the VR context in comparison to the sensory booth was observed. Um, you can see that in the image. Uh, that was basically an indication that the VR restaurant had a positive impact on consumer hedonic ratings of beef steaks. Conclusions. Um, so sensory consumer studies could benefit from VR um, as it facilitates experiments that could be otherwise expensive, uh, challenging or time consuming to conduct in real life environment. The results from this study demonstrated that the surrounding context has a significant impact on consumer sensory perception of beef steaks. Um, as you can see, the future is digital and the context is a key part of the consumer experience. So if any of you is interested to use virtual reality, feel free to contact me after this webinar and I'll be happy to talk to you and investigate which um, can be the best approach for your business, for your products and to design further uh, sensory trials. Thank you and back to you, Carol. 
Thanks, Christina. So just in in finishing off, we're going to look um, for a second on, on how to get the best out of your sensory service. So the first step for me when I talk to a client about their sensory needs is what do they want to achieve? So they need to be really clear about this. We then can choose the most relevant sensory test methods <clears throat> and also how we're going to collect that information. Are we going to use a train panel or do we need to use consumers or do we need to carry out a combination of both? So where will the test be carried out? Will it be in one location? Will it be throughout the country? <clears throat> um, it might be in the consumers' homes. So during lockdown, I had great success with a product that I sent out to consumers' homes. And also, um, we virtually use a train panel as well over Zoom to assess products. So as Christina said, the, the future is digital. So all this um, dictates the budget. And that budget then should be agreed um, and everything should be agreed and signed off, including the time scales and exactly what type of report your client needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. So thank you for your attention. Um, Kira is going to put up some questions. So I'll uh, thank you. We'll give Carol a chance to. Um have a drink of water there and clear your throat before we bombard you with some questions. Um, so I just encourage if anybody has any other questions for either Christina or Carol um, following on from that presentation, I'd encourage you just to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom um, and I'll address them. Uh, so we'll just... Um, First question is in relation to something you presented in the in the slides, Carol. And um, so the, the question about what are JAR or G A or scores? Um, so Kira, if I could just get one more minute. Sorry, I just need to get. It. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. And maybe Christina. I think it's all questions for Christina. Yeah, no problem. Um, so in relation to. Yes, there's something here on the virtual reality specifically, Christina. So um, a question around what kind of products have you applied the virtual reality to so, to so far when carrying out sensory testing? All right, so um, so far we worked with three different products. One I already presented to you, so we worked with beef steaks and um, we studied the impact of two environments, so it was the sensory booth and the immersive virtual reality restaurant. And we worked with two more products and that's chocolate and popcorn. Okay, um, and there's another question here to ask, um, has any of that been published to date? Is there a publication available? In relation um, to yes, uh, so the study with chocolate was presented last year at Pangborn conference and the study with um, beef steaks at ICOMS conference also last year and both of them are in uh, drafting now. We are drafting a, a paper for publishing so that will be available hopefully um, by the end of this year online. Okay, great. Um, yeah. We have the, the person who posed that question, we have your details and we can communicate with you often. Absolutely, yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, uh, another question in relation to the um, virtual reality. Um, are there any other immersive virtual environments that could be used? So you showed the restaurant um, scenario there, Christina, but are there others that we have used or that could be used? Yes, so uh, we have three other um, environments that we can use. So, for example, on the study about the chocolate, we were looking on the influence of, um, uh, let's say, disturbing factors that we might have in our environment. So we tried to see um, how the consumer will perceive the chocolate in the city environment, which is um, a busy environment, versus a countryside. So we have a beautiful Irish green uh, landscape that uh, the people were immersed in and tried to, uh, to eat the chocolates and also for the popcorn trial we have a um, virtual cinema that we can immerse people and they can try popcorn in the uh, uh, virtual cinema environment versus the sensory booth 
think as a, as a sensory panelist, I very much like the sound of the virtual reality. <laughs> sitting in a white booth. Um, Carol, how, how is your throat now? Fine, thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you were so asking, yeah, but go just, back uh, to the jar. Right yeah, scales, you yeah. Could just... So it's another way of getting some more information, a uh, deeper information about the uh, how much people prefer or like your different attributes. So just about right. It's a five uh, scale. Uh, um, so it's like um, oh sorry. So is taking the sweetness from before. So is the sweetness just about right, or is it a little too sweet, or a little bit not sweet enough, or is it far too sweet, or is it really um, not at all sweet? So you can compare products as well uh, as part of the product development process. So you don't just use it as a consumer technique. It can be used in, in many different ways. So it's, 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 it's a short five point scale and it's quite simplistic and, and consumer friendly yeah, terms. That absolutely, are yeah. And I suppose the, the center point is the just about right then. Okay. Yeah, so when you use uh, consumer questionnaires, they need to be really clear and concise. You don't want to confuse people. You don't want to have them sitting there answering questions too, too long. Um, and just where they answer the question. So uh, Christina had asked about, had mentioned about immersive. Um, so when we use the uh, home use test, so not just in boots, we send products home. So one of the products we sent home was a children's product because we didn't want to bring children in to the center. So it was, um, they were uh, either the children or the parents, they were asking, uh, they were asked just about right. So is the texture just about right? How does it feel in my mouth? Do I really like it? Do I really not like it? Is it way too sweet? Is it a little too sweet? And then we superimposed faces of that jar scale for them. So there's lots of different ways you can use those kind of things. Okay. And it's a universally accepted scoring. Yeah. 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 Maybe not as widespreadly used as the hedonic scale. but It's, it's used different. in combination with it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll move on to another question. Sorry, they were all interlinked. Uh, um, a yeah. Of questions from <clears throat> the same person. Um, a uh, question here on consumer testing um, in children. How how would you approach consumer testing in children, or how would it differ from from that with adults? Um, the different ages can. So if you look at, at their development, so it, it's difficult to get proper responses from children under the age of five, so before the school age. So if anyone is children, they know that as they grow up in the ages, they're able to either um, listen to a question or actually read it themselves. So um you would have a simpler scale <clears throat> sorry Kira, go ahead no you're okay um christina maybe could you follow on from that is there potential use in the virtual reality for um could could the virtual reality be used um with with uh, younger consumers or children? Oh, absolutely. Actually, the feedback that we had from kids um, to events like Science Week that was organized in Chagas uh, was very good. So the, the queue of kids that were waiting to be immersed in um, any virtual reality environment was, was very large and they were very enthusiastic. And as I said earlier on, um, I'd say that uh, that's the future and that's what we are trying to bring in and move on from the traditional methods that are currently available and try to see how we can uh, improve and how we can reduce the timings and reduce uh, as well the cost and make it more um, interactive and make it more fun. Great, thanks Christina. Um, and I see another question here that, that I can probably provide the answer to, or if Carol if you or Christina want to chip in. So the question is, do, provide, do Chagas provide grants for sensory analysis? Um, we don't, we provide the service, um, but there are grants, we don't provide fi financial funding, but there are grants that are widely available um, from Enterprise Ireland, um, the local enterprise boards, um, so a company can avail of something like an innovation voucher to carry out a concise piece of sensory work on a, a particular product um, that they may want to launch or reformulate. Um, so hopefully that helps there. Um, Carol, how are you now? Do you? Yeah, fine. Thanks. Sorry about this. Um, I see a question about <coughs> infant formulas and can they be used? Um, 
it's energy evaluated. It's a really, really specialized area. It is something <clears throat> I sometimes say I don't work with children or animals, but um, it, it's a really specialized. So lots and lots of ethical issues there um, to go into. So um, we can, if, if someone is interested in talking about that, we have um, lots of our experts work on um, infant formula in Burr Park. So we'd all work together. So if that person has a particular interest, um, they can contact, contact us offline and we can have a chat about that. Okay. I'm very conscious of the time at this point. Um, so I'll, I'll pose one final question, if that's okay. Um, and it's in relation to... Oh, sorry. I, I see one coming in here, um, which might be relevant to a lot of companies. It says, has COVID affected the sensory panels? Is it still possible to do sensory work as before, or are the panel sizes reduced? Um, <clears throat> so um, we're back in doing um, um, work with our train panels. So we have changed the whole um, uh, layout and design. So we are encompassing our entire suite to uh, carry out um, assessments using our train panel of eight people, whereas before we'd have used um, double that amount of people. So we're totally back. All of the procedures are in place. Um, I've said also sent home use tests out for product for, where it's applicable. So something like a chocolate product can be sent out, can be delivered. So we're working around that. Um, but also we're, um, when the train panels aren't in place, we're bringing in small amounts of people or else we're using external people. Um, who use uh, social distancing and have larger premises. So as of now, we're fully back um, and, and can handle. And also what we find is training, <clears throat> the screening and training of panels. I've been doing uh, quite a bit of training online and certain amounts of panel training in company, we can also do as a virtual. Obviously you're gonna need some face-to-face -face as well because it generates the um, it was the closest of the panel working together. So a combination of all of those are, are open yeah. to business. So the initial training could be done online and that developed into maybe a face-to-face -face with social Yeah, testing. initial, initial screening can be done by the yeah. company and, and then carry on, yeah. So the key, key message is we're open for business and please do engage. Um, and I'm going to wrap up this session now. Um, I'd like to thank both Christina and Carol for their time this morning. Um, and I would say to you, the audience, if you have any questions following on to that, that from this, please do feel free um, to address us, to, to address them to us um, personally afterwards. So thank you all and goodbye for now.